Hey everyone, welcome back to FPL Fran. Today's video is going to be my team selection here for Game Week 31. But before we jump into the Game Week 31 team selection, I quickly wanted to recap and review Game Week 30. This was obviously a week where we decided not to go for Salah and we decided to sort of delay the move to Game Week 31. Now, in hindsight, I would say it hasn't really worked out because obviously the two players that I was planning to get, move on for Salah this week in Game Week 31 would have been Bruno Fernandes and Watkins. And as it turns out, Watkins was miraculously sort of injured. He suffered a knock within the game versus Wolves. And the sort of club doctors had basically basically mentioned to Unai Emery that he wasn't available to play. So that changed things a lot. And of course, in hindsight, you know, if we knew things like this, we would probably have moved, you know, into another forward. And then Fernand, of course, uh, the, le the less said about him, the better. But it was just another shocking performance from United overall. Um, not specifically, of course, just an individual performance that just was poor from Bruno, but just consistently we've, we've seen that United have basically performed um, like a bottom half team despite their sort of league position and Bruno is someone who also suffers from that but I think you know moving on the reality is we want to move into Salah for gaming 31 and that's that the week was still overall quite good though because we got 65 points and a very very slim green arrow you know the only person who really did any business for me uh, truly was Pau Torres who actually got a clean sheet in a week where a lot of people were not getting clean sheets except for Kirka somehow the Arsenal defense and of course some of Pau Torres's peers within Emi Martinez and Conza who some people did um, own fortunately for myself though, I'm a little bit it's a little bit bittersweet where if I rolled last week, for example, and just went for Saliba and I, I would have actually somehow managed to jam three clean sheets from some pretty subpar players. However, I still still think it was actually a good move to go for Gusto. Now ho the hopefully the the issue I think with him is that he seems like he has a hamstring injury. We know that always takes two to three weeks if it's even, you know, a sort of low grade sprain. The, issue, the question, of course, is whether it actually is a true issue or whether it was just a contact issue and actually he's fine and, and there's actually nothing really wrong, wrong with his hamstring. So we have to sort of assess that situation. Um, right now, I can confirm I've made two transfers and I will talk about them later in the video. But that's, of course, the sort of predicament with uh, owning Gusto and unfortunately benching six points within Saliba, who actually ended up getting seven. In other aspects, of course, I think we got the captaincy right in the sense that I think Sun outperformed Salah, who... I was really only considering those two as captaincy options. Now, of course, when you look at my team, I don't have Salah and I vice captain Palmer. I think there was a bit of fortune in that game as well. Even if you get to review the game, the penalty was a bit suspect. And of course, Burnley going towards 10 men quite early in the game was probably not something I had planned. Sun also had plenty of chances and Salah even more chances. So um, as it turns out, obviously, all three of these players were fantastic captaincy options and it doesn't um, surprised me that they ended up all doing quite well. A bit fortunate, of course, I have to say that Salah did, you know, as poorly as he did because he had plenty of chances. And whenever Salah has that many chances, you just need to thank your lucky stars that you're not biting um, a little bit more than that. So that's the reality with my team. I'm pretty happy that I've now moved into Salah and I can confirm that right now. And that's it, right? 65 points. We're at 362 in the world. Sorry, just to correct myself. That's what FPL says right now. I think w when I record and put this video out, it's going to say 363. Uh, but the one rank difference, I suppose, you know, makes all the difference in the world. Anyways, moving on. So to my team selection this week, defense is still pretty poor. However, it still has two Arsenal players. So that's a nice little uh, feature. We've got Saliba and Gabriel. So we did bench Saliba last week. Now he get, gets to sort of play once again. Ultimately, it's a very poor defense. But what can you do? I still think Arsenal are just going to play full strength pretty much until the end of the season. And obviously, Saliba and Gabriel, we've seen them play countless times, even, you know, with midweek fixtures. So I really am not that concerned about rotation here. These are the best options that I have. With Neto as my goalkeeper. Now, I'm going to play Neto no matter what, right? It's Crystal Palace at home. It's a very good fixture. We always tend to see these as situations where you just play someone like Neto. But I think the reality is we know as well that Neto is very, very close to being dropped by Andoni Iraola. And of course, the situation is that he's been awful. And... I think, I, and I would expect, I'm probably going to have to call upon Flecken somehow, who's going to face Brighton and probably concede very, very easily, because that's not surprising when you actually start Flecken within your team. And that's that, right? I hope for the best with Neto. He's got the best fixture here, best clean sheet odds compared to Flecken, my sort of comparable keeper here. And that's that. As soon as Neto gets dropped, we probably have to reconsider him as our goalkeeper. And that sort of also throws us into a little bit of a predicament, because it also means that maybe I'm without a double gimme uh, 34 goalkeeper. But whether that actually changes my transfer plans, I don't know. So we'll have to sort of monitor that situation. I think worst case scenario, one thing about Gaming 34 that I can mention is that Brentford do still have a good fixture on paper. It's Luton away. Uh, we do expect that Luton will probably score though. Um, so it's not a very good situation. 
Of course, the hope is that Neto somehow keeps his spot within the team as the captain of the team. But yeah, the less said about him, the better. Unfortunately, with my team this week, I'm going to put a yellow warning sign over Gusto. Now, I did mention, of course, in the start of the video when I was reviewing Gaming 30, that it seems like Gusto, of course, has suffered a hamstring injury. What I think we'll need, of course, is a press conference from Pochettino basically confirming this injury and making um, us move towards another direction. And I think what I have in my plans is to keep Gusto within my team no matter what, because Ultimately, I don't see Reese James coming back anytime soon. Hopefully, the injury for Gusto isn't too bad. Apparently, he did walk off fine. And we'll have to see, of course, what the situation is for his sort of timeline as far as Gusto is concerned. But we have two options right now. I think we have two options in the sense that with the amount of money I have in the bank, I can actually go from one of my defenders like Doughty or Pau Torres into a Guardiol from City or a Virgil van Dijk from Liverpool. Now, Virgil van Dijk obviously has the best fixture, and this is a great opportunity to get one of your bullet headers from Virgil van Dijk. But with Guardiol, you're actually looking at a player who ultimately is going to serve my team better for Gaming 37. And depending on how bad this Ake injury is, you know, he could have very, very good guaranteed minutes for the City team with the occasional rest that just happens when you have to play that many games of top play football in a row, which I think, you know, Pep will accommodate for. But with the lack of depth in the team, with good fixtures coming up for City regardless, and, you know, a double in the distance, I think uh, Guardiola is an interesting sort of route towards a City defense um, at a very cheap price of 4.8 million. So I really like Guardiola as an option, potentially if I can go towards him. And, and then moving off to the rest of my team here, you know, I, I have the chance, of course, to maybe go for Virgil, right? Because... With the two transfers that I've made, I have more money in the bank now. I've still got Salo within the team, and Virgil is accessible. The difference, of course, with Virgil and someone like Bradley is, even though Bradley is probably the more interesting prospect for this game versus Sheffield United at home, Bradley is probably unlikely to play within Gaming 34. Now, of course, Klopp can actually give us an update in terms of, let's say, trend for Gaming 34, but I think we, we estimate that he comes back versus Atalanta, which means that still he will be back before Gaming 34 which sort of ruins the Bradley option for me. And as someone who already missed the boat of Bradley this week and also missed the sort of three additional points that would have gotten from Bradley over Gusto, you know, we just have to sort of take that on the chin, unfortunately, and just move on with our FPL transfers. So in the midfield position here, we actually have the four-piece midfield now, slightly different from last week, but basically the same with another red shirted player here in Salah, Sun, Saka, and Palmer to round out the team as well. Sun is someone that I didn't really want to take out of my team because, yes, of course, Sun is going to blank in Game Week 34, but because I don't actually have any additional Spurs players and, and no additional blankers in Game Week 34, I like the idea of just keeping Sun in my team for the rest of the season because I think we, we have some Liverpool players that have shaky minutes, right? Players like Darwin, players like Luis Diaz, although Luis Diaz, I think, has started 10 games in a row. You know, when we talk to Darwin or talk about Darwin, I think Gakpo is, is due to start you know, a, a game like the Sheffield United at home fixture. So my concern really is that that could happen in this situation and moving into Darwin for an additional minus four isn't really worthwhile because I can't go from Bruno to Watkins to Salah plus Darwin. It's not as simple as that for me. I'd have to go through Sun. So I don't like the idea of going out of Sun and neither do I like the idea of taking an additional minus four just for Darwin to potentially be benched for Sheffield United. Now with the Luis Diaz situation, I think one thing that I don't like about it so much is that if I go for Luis Diaz now, one of my concerns for going for that move is that I might be a little bit too rigid within my team and it might be a bit tough to also find transfers away from Luis Diaz at around Gimme 35 because I think only Rich Halson really is a player that I'm thinking about. Maybe Gordon as well. Anthony Gordon is a very, very good transfer away from him. But I, I think it also sort of locks my team up in a way and I'd have to go into either Semenyo or Muniz. Now, that would have been also for an additional minus four. And it's a tricky situation, I think, to sort of move into Luis Diaz. I'd much rather wait until, let's say, game weeks 33 or 34, where I can just go for him as a one-week punt. Maybe even go for Esley potentially as well instead, um, as opposed to spending so much money there. I think there are more guarantees with, uh, with Virgil van Dijk as well. One of the interesting things, of course, is that Liverpool are sort of invested within the Europa League. And so if you see that, of course, the priority is the Premier League, which I think it very much is. Luis Diaz is someone who's gone, gotten a lot of minutes so far, and he potentially is a better pick than, let's say, um, a, a Darwin just in terms of guaranteed minutes. However, of course, one of the big things that we do say about Luis Diaz is that he still has slightly subpar underlying stats compared to the rest of the field. Although I also have to mention that his stats have ticked up, and of course his minutes have also ticked up, showing, of course, that there's confidence in his play from Klopp and also you know, in him as an option. But I'll keep my options available in terms of whether I want to go for Luis Diaz. It is an additional minus four, as I mentioned, uh, but I could very well go there with the transfer, let's say maybe something like Neto to Luis Diaz. That could 
um, that could still be possible for me right now. I've got 2.3 million in the bank, and of course, Luis Diaz is only 7.5 million, which means that I had 0.4 million remaining, and I could still go for that Guardiola transfer no matter what. Um, so it's something that's still sort of hanging over my mind, whether I go for Luis Diaz as well. That would mean, however, that I drop Muniz, and I think one of the reasons why I've actually gone into Muniz, as you can see within my forwards right now, a um, bit of a spoiler, apologies, but the reason why I've actually gone to Muniz as opposed to a Semenyo, a Kunha, or Mateta is because I think there are all some risks, there are all, there are all risks with uh, certain players, right? If I go for Kunha, I can't go for Luis Diaz anyways, and the unfortunate issue with going for Kunha is that I need him to start for this week, which I don't think he will. Um, I think he'll probably start and give me 32 instead if I was being cautious. And ultimately, it seems like Wolves are being cautious, right? Because that's why he didn't feature in game week 30 at all. As far as Mateta, I think, yes, of course, it seems like Glasner has preferred him to Eduard, who is out right now. But if Eduard comes back, let's say, anytime before game week 34, I just think that there's still going to be probable situations where Mateta is not going to get the full 85, 90 minutes that we expect. Maybe, maybe I'm wrong about this, but I feel like we've had such a short stint with Glasner so far. And we've had a great stint, obviously, for Mateta under Glasner. But I also think that since Eduard is not a complete dud of a player, you can't just suddenly omit, let's say, Eduard being an option that could sort of ruin Mateta's minutes later down the line. And then the last option in terms of uh, Semenyo, who I probably haven't even mentioned previously, is that Semenyo is an interesting pick because actually if you look at the last four to five games for Bournemouth, Semenyo is clocked 90 minutes of football in each, in each game. So it seems like he's obviously moved up the pecking order with Bournemouth. But on the flip side, once again, Bournemouth are a team where outside of Solanke, I think, some of the some of the attackers can sort of lose their minutes over time. So it only takes a few bad performances for Semenyo to sort of maybe lose his spot in the pecking order or maybe lose that sort of 90 minutes nailedness that we actually like to see. On top of that, of course, I have mentioned time and time again that those away fixtures for Bournemouth aren't great. So the ceiling theoretically for Semenyo is probably actually worse than a Mateta, probably worse than a Kunha as well. But Kunha, of course, as I said, you know, is someone who I don't like as a transfer because it's unfortunately blocking me from having a good team this week. And it's not something I like to do when I take a minus four. So that's sort of why I've gone for Muniz. Muniz is someone who, you know, I like my sample size, but I think I've seen enough with Muniz, to be quite honest. That's why he's been green on the cheat sheet for the last two weeks. Um, another thing, too, of course, is that he is someone that I think is going to have great minutes going forwards. He might even be on penalties. And, and the reason why I say this is because with, with Fulham, we have never been sure who's the penalty taker, really. We've seen William take penalties, Andreas take penalties. But I, I, I can't see why there would be a reason where Muniz wouldn't take penalties. Now, Muniz has never taken a penalty in his life, um, at least in a competitive penalty. So that, of course, is going to throw away my suggestion. But I just think that there's so much upside here with Muniz. Um, and, of course, he's been so ridiculous so far that it is a bit of a no-brainer to go with Muniz and to hope that the ceiling is theoretically even higher than it is right now. So I really like Muniz as an option. And the additional money in the bank just allows me to be flexible with whatever Liverpool player I might want to take an additional hit for. So right now, I've taken a minus four. The team is as it is. Gusto obviously has a yellow asterisk. I might move to Virgil van Dijk. I might move to Guardiol. If I go for Guardiol, I could even go for Luis Diaz, but that would feel a little bit odd, right? I'd have to probably actually bench Muniz, which feels odd, but it, it might be something that I, I'd, I'd be inclined to do. So we'll see how the situation goes. I still think that Nottingham Forest are still a pretty subpar team. And so this is a good chance for Muniz to do well as he does every week practically. So uh, we've gone for Muniz here. And hopefully with the additional money in the bank, I can actually make better moves in the future. Maybe, of course, sort of save money so that I can maybe upgrade any players within my defense if need be. Potentially, if there's an angle for me to go Trent somehow um, later down the line, I'll consider it. Although I think it's it's practically impossible now because I'm, I'm too stacked within the attacking positions. And that 2.3 million in the bank will only really allow me to get towards Virgil van Dijk, who I'm pretty keen to actually own this week if we get the all clear. Um, that Gusto is unfortunately out. So that's going to be my team selection. Um, and of course, I didn't really need to mention this, but Saka is going to be my vice captain and Salah is going to be my captain. I just think um, with Saka, of course, having showing a little bit of fatigue, which is what Arteta basically confirmed the situation to be, um, and Salah looking fantastic versus Brighton, at least in terms of the amount of chances he was able to get himself into as opposed to the clinical finishing aspect. Um, you know, he's going to be a no-brain captain for me. So no-brainer captain for me. Um, hopefully we do have brains this week, but that's going to be it for me. Um, thank you guys so much for watching. Hope you guys are doing well. I'll see you guys in the next video. Take care and goodbye. And I'll see you guys soon.